Welcome to a conversation with history. I'm Harry Chrysler of the Institute of International Studies. Our guest today is Nayan Chanda, who is Director of Publications, the Yale Center for the Study of Globalization, and he's also editor of Yale Global Online. He's a former editor of the Far Eastern Economic Review and the Asian Wall Street Journal Weekly. His new book is Bound Together, How Traders, Preachers, Adventurers, and Warriors have shaped modern globalization. Nayan, welcome back to Berkeley. Thank you very much, Harry. When did you get the idea for doing this book? The idea of doing this book came, uh, I think, towards the beginning of this uh, millennium. Mm -hmm. um, I was, actually the idea started in 1999 when I was preparing as editor of the Far Eastern Economic Review uh, how to publish some special issues on the new millennium on, in 2000. And in doing research to find out what we should be writing in 2000, I said, how would finding out how life was on January 1st, 1000, mm -hmm. so that we can compare how mm. life has changed. And that research led me to realize that what we take for granted in Asia as Asian wasn't there in 1000. And just to exa an example, um, chili, hot food is Asian uh, sort of identity, culinary identity. Chili wasn't in Asia. Chili was brought by Portuguese and Spanish traders in the 16th century. So um, same thing with tobacco. Chinese were the world's biggest smokers, but there's no tobacco until 16th century. Mm -hmm. So stuff like that made me realize that the world that we live in today has roots going back to far, far away and in far distance in time. Mm -hmm. And so thinking about that and asking myself questions uh, brought me to take a look at globalization in a historical perspective. Mm -hmm. And, and your, your purpose and, and goal uh, was, was to inform people about the intricacies of this history and how it led to where we are today? Yeah, it is. I think to understand how we came about, how the world we live now came about, and that globalization as a Terminology is very recent. It came into dictionary only in 1961. But as a process, historical process in which communities, world communities, people living distances were connected increasingly, and that phenomenon is very old. And so I want to track that phenomenon, the process, and to understand how we came where we are today. And, and in addition to being uh, an editor of these two very important uh, global uh, uh, weeklies, uh, Far Eastern Economic Review, the, the Wall Street Journal uh, uh, Weekly on Asia. Uh, uh, you were trained in history, and your father was a historian. So, so this is like a duck going back to the water, really. In some ways, yes. <laughs> yeah. As a student of history, I always found extremely uh, useful and interesting to look at present events with some historical perspective to understand better. And so that is, that's certainly my training in history and my father's influence certainly <laughs> played some role. And going into the book, did you start with a, a hypothesis about what you were going to find and, and did it hold up? Yeah, in fact, uh, the hypothesis kind of emerged slowly as I read on. I started asking the question, why these things are globalized? How did it happen? And then asked myself the question, if it is globalized, somebody must have done it. Somebody have taken upon themselves 
to bring things from point A to point B and from B to C, and who were these people? And so the idea of finding some actors who are involved in globalization sort of emerged slowly, and I, I ultimately settled on four actors, mm -hmm. the traders, preachers, adventurers, and warriors. So that kind of Eureka moment came uh, pretty early on. Mm -hmm. And in these, so, so in a way you're, you're, you're looking at the world's interconnectedness and, and you, uh, shall we call them Weberian ideal types, mm -hmm. warriors, preachers, traders, and adventurers who, who, who are real people. I mean, they're not ideal, but, but, but in, in some sense they're a type that recurs again and again. again. And, and that, that motivation is kind of uh, universal. And as I show in the book that the lone traders of the Mesopotamian civilization who started out riding a donkey going several hundred miles has now been replaced by 63,000 multinationals who mm -hmm. are taking their stuff on container ship and jumbo jet. Uh, preachers, uh, Christian, Buddhist, uh, Islamic preachers have now been joined by a new category of preachers, the people who are interested in human rights, environment, and they want to, the world to live better and live well and follow certain principles. And then adventurers, uh, Marco Polos and Ibn Battutas have been now replaced by hundreds of millions of tourists mm -hmm. and migrants who are traveling the world looking for fulfilling life. And then warriors, Alexander the Great and Genghis Khan's warriors have been replaced by warriors of different types who may be actually flying a predator drone sitting in an Air Force base in the United States. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but the nature, the decision or desire to dominate and establish a an universal empire that survives. Mm -hmm. So that's the point I try to make, that the four motivations that mm -hmm. I identify have been with us from the beginning of history. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, as let's put on your historian's hat and uh, uh, are, do, do individuals make history? Is, is it, as you look at this history that you're talking about, is it, is it uh, the, the, the Alexander the Great, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the theologian who travels the world who are making the history, or do they become part of larger historical forces? Because that, that's really the old question in history. Is it, you know, is, is it men and women that make history, or is it or the, these, these social forces? Yeah, I, I come to the conclusion that this is individual men and women who make history by riding a tide or a force which, is, which goes beyond them. Mm -hmm. So if they are not on that tide, if they are not on the flow, they will not be able to make much difference. But riding that flow, they do make difference. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I know that in in the book, you you actually asked yourself the question, uh, "How globalized am I?" <laughs> Tell us about that and, and your 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 search to uh, for your ancestry and your own DNA. Yes, I think um, this premise of the book is that the world is increasingly connected, but before you connect, you are obviously disconnected. So mm -hmm. what was the state when we were disconnected, when the world and the people lived far apart and did not know each other? And that led me to ask the question, how people did get dispersed? Mm -hmm. And the question that led me to the answer to is that our ancestors, human community, lived all in Africa. And, and now it is clear from DNA studies that between 200 to 2,000 people left Africa and spread to the rest of the world. So I wanted to find out how my ancestors, did they really come from Africa? So I sent a swab from inside my cheek to DNA. DNA. Yeah. 
to the National Genographic Project, mm -hmm. which actually does analysis of your DNA on payment of a small fee. And I gave them the serial number, the, the uh, serial number. So they only knew my serial number. They did not know who I was. Mm -hmm. And several weeks later, I checked on the web, typed in my serial number. And it told me that I was Indian that my marker, DNA marker M52, was an Indian marker, and that my ancestors came from East Africa some 40 to 60,000 years ago. And studying the Y chromosome traces in my DNA, they could tell me how the, the trajectory they took to come to India. So which was fascinating, that they passed through Middle East, Persia, and then landed in India, on the west coast of India. Mm -hmm. and, and the fact is that the earliest Y chromosome in my DNA is marker M168. That is the DNA marker that you have and every single male human on this planet have. Mm -hmm. And that I find a very uh, uplifting knowledge that we all are members of the same family. Mm -hmm. and, and that is undeniable because the DNA tells you that you all have M168, all male have M168, mm -hmm. and the females have the same mitochondrial DNA that links you to one African mother. Mm -hmm. So uh, in, in exploring the world, uh, in reaching out as a preacher, an adventurer, a warrior, uh, a trader, uh, what, what human impulses are at work here? There is a sense when you read the book that, that these uh, ideal types really reflect something in the human spirit, which gets further into this question of who we are beyond where we came from. Talk a little about that. What, what distinguishes uh, uh, each of these different categories, or are they more alike than we realize? There is uh, this very interesting question. Uh, first of all, the desire of the humans to actually want to live in security and comfort and lead a better life than one has, improve one's living standard. That is a desire which is leading traders to leave home and go somewhere to indulge in what Adam Smith calls track and trade. There's a human impulse to track and trade. And track and trade for what? To actually make profit. Mm -hmm. So one of the earliest examples I found in the in S. Mesopotamian clay tablet uh, written by wife of a trader to her husband who lives 800 miles away in Canis. She writes to him uh, that ever since you left, our neighbor, who is a trader, has doubled the size of his house. So when can he do ours? <laughs> and, and that... Now that doesn't sound familiar at all. Yes, <laughs> yeah, yeah. exactly. And this was 4,000 years ago. And mm -hmm. then you have a letter by a Jewish trader from Cairo, who actually lived in India in the 10th century. And his correspondence had now been found in this um, synagogue in Cairo because the, Kairos, the synagogues have this practice of not destroying any piece of paper if it has the word God on it. And mm -hmm. since all the letters were written by the grace of God, we have done this transaction, by the grace of God, we have made this journey. So all this correspondence, commercial correspondence, actually were protected. Mm -hmm. So one of the letters written by someone called Abraham Izu, he says that I have now made enough money, I'm returning from India and writing to his brother that we can now live happily with the money I have made in India. Mm -hmm. And this was again in the 10th mm -hmm. century. So mm -hmm. it, it is the same desire that traders go out. Mm -hmm. Look at uh, preachers, the desire to bring fellow human beings to your faith. You have found God, you have found prophet, and you want everybody to embrace that God. And that desire led uh, Christian missionaries to set out and go far distances. Buddha, of course, was the world's first evangelist, if I want to use the term evangelist for Buddha. But Buddha, after he attained Bodhi, he told his disciples, now go out and preach the faith 
preach the, the doctrine, the dharma, that this is the way to live, lead your life and you can actually attain nirvana so that you will no longer suffer from pain and death. And so this preaching, desire to preach, is again is very innate in human mm. being. And that is what leading people in um, someone like Peter Benenson, the founder of Amnesty International, set up this organization in 1961 because human beings cannot be abused. They have rights. Mm. And this is the truth he wants everybody to embrace. And so this is uh, one motivation. And you can say this motivation also is to live an uh, enriching, fulfilling life by helping others. So mm -hmm. when I mentioned this fact to the Human, Human Rights Watch Asia director in New York, Ken Roth, he kind of demurred. He doesn't want to be called a preacher. Mm -hmm. But he admitted that mm -hmm. people who do this kind of job, they do make sacrifice because they have a goal in life, mission to help. And so they are making personal sacrifice to go distance, long distances, to find out about human rights abuse and bringing world focus on them. And, and it's, a, it's a kind of a recognition of a universalism exactly. that, that should yes. be the, a gift to, yeah. to everyone, exactly. a right. Yeah. Exactly. And, and adventure is the same thing. The desire to find out what is behind the next mountain. Mm -hmm. What is there even if I cross the river? This curiosity to find is also, it is to enrich life. Mm -hmm. And to enrich one's life, one takes an enormous risk. Mm -hmm. And now the same desire to enrich one's life, you have people carrying a backpack and lonely planet guide going out to mm -hmm. different parts of the world. Mm -hmm. So the same desire is there. Mm -hmm. And the desire to have a universal empire, the universal control, human beings, territory, resources, so that there could be one principle, guiding principle. Alexander mm -hmm. the Great wanted to create a universal empire. And what I think the United States wants is an empire of democracy. We mm -hmm. want to have everybody to be democratic, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and then behind that, there is desire for to control resources, territories, which are critical for national interest. Mm -hmm. So these wishes are, again, uh, universal and and very long lasting. In what in what sense do you believe that uh, seeing this continuity in history, so that the, the 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 Buddha and his disciples somehow morph uh, into the present day reality of of environmental activists and you, what, uh, what what is the benefit of seeing that? There definitely seems to be such a thing that one one has a sense of of the continuity of this human enterprise. Yeah, I think benefit is to uh, to recognize that it is the globalization as we I define it as the outcome of this forces working mm -hmm. over a long period of time. It's a secular force which is hard to stop because it is not one, two, three people. It's a whole mass of people, mm -hmm. their mm -hmm. desire, their fear, their ambition. And this is all coming together to produce this force. Mm -hmm. So so that it is something that is impossible to stop forever. It mm -hmm. can be slowed down, it can be even blocked for a period, but the force behind it Mm -hmm. is so inexorable because there's so many people involved here mm -hmm. that it is it is a impossible notion that you can actually stop it uh, I get uh, talking now about the craft at work here and you're writing this book uh, which I think I will show to the audience again Chalmers Johnson once suggested that I show the book more often in the interview which I'm going to do uh, uh, you, uh, one gets the sense that your journalists, your, the craft of journalism, kind of uh, uh, empowers you to to tell these stories, which further the the general education about these problems. Is that a, a fair assessment? That because in the in the book there are these beautiful 
uh, stories, vignettes that powerfully bring home the point? Yeah, I think being a journalist basically means being a communicator, mm -hmm. uh, transferring useful, interesting information to the general public in a way that they would, they can appreciate. And scholars publish papers, scholars publish their research, they don't need to communicate because they're writing for their peers. Mm -hmm. Whereas journalist is writing for a sort of a, a larger audience who needs to be entertained as they're informed. Mm -hmm. Just pure information mm -hmm. would not do. Mm -hmm. So, so I can, you can say that my being a journalist for over 30 years has helped me to see how I can present this, this sort of historical facts and analysis in a more sort of um, attractive way. Mm -hmm. Now, in, in this story that you're telling, there is a, an interplay uh, between these uh, different types uh, over time uh, that I would like to talk to you a little about because it's an important point. So something like uh, the Silk Road, which in history is an, a very important trade route, is also uh, an important route uh, for preachers who, who are preaching on the same road. Talk a little about that because, because these, these forces embodied in the individual categories uh, and in the stories of, of particular individuals in history kind of interface with each other. Absolutely. In fact, this is the other thing which I, I remark in the book is that these four actors, they are not separated by walls. Mm -hmm. In fact, all four could be in, in one person, all four motivations, certainly two, three. Uh, take for instance, uh, Christopher Columbus, was he an adventurer? Was he a trader? Mm -hmm. Or was he a preacher? Mm -hmm. In fact, all three. Mm -hmm. In fact, he was a warrior too. So he goes out across the Atlantic to go to India. He didn't go to discover anything. So he, in that sense, he was not a discoverer. He was going to an old place, India, by a new route so that he could get there fast. And once he gets there, he will get the spices which will make King of Spain a very rich person. <laughs> and he wanted to go to Japan a Chipangu, as Marco Polo described in his book, which apparently had uh, roofs made of gold tiles. So Columbus wanted to go to Japan as well to get gold. Mm -hmm. And what would he do with the gold? He would enrich the Spanish coffer so that the Spanish king could raise an army to go and recover Jerusalem from the Muslims. Mm -hmm. So again, he's a Christian missionary zeal was one of his motivations. Mm -hmm. So, so the roles of the actors are sometimes, you know, overlapping. And as you mentioned, the this, this Silk Road. Silk Road was developed by traders, but it was used by preachers. Swan so Sang, the Chinese, famous Chinese preacher, a monk, he came down Silk Road to India. He spent 16 years, and he went back by the Silk Road. And he went back carrying with him 700 Buddhist texts, which actually was a huge contribution to understanding between China and India, but overall understanding of Buddhism globally, because those texts survived in the Tun Huan cave, translated by the Chinese into Chinese, hmm. and it was found by Stein, Austrian um, uh, archaeologist, and those documents provided the information that historians now have to understand what was, what was the Buddhist doctrine like and what was the society like. So the connections were established by preachers and adventurers like Stein find them and bring it to the world. So there was always overlap between these four actors. Mm -hmm. and, and looking back at this history, not, not talking yet about the present, which we're going to get into in a second, it, it seems like uh, 
is it a story of several step forwards and then a few steps back and then steps forward again? In other words, and is there something you can tell us about this cycle of for, you know the, of the pendulum swinging forward and then back a little, but then forward more? Yeah, absolutely. It has this has never been a, um, a linear progress. Always twists and turns and ups and downs. Take for instance the Indus Valley civilization, which developed in the Indus River in the western India, and Euphrates Tigris River Valley in Mesopotamia. These two civilizations were uh, trading pretty heavily to uh, four thousand years ago. And then archaeologists now surmise that this trading involved a lot of felling of timber, making of boats, making of houses. Mm. Whether as a result of this deforestation, rivers beds silted up and trading became difficult. And Mohenjo-Daro Harappa civilization disappeared mm. and the trading stopped. And then the trading began again by another route which was later on linked to the Silk Road, basically by using camel. So, and the camel caravan and the horse caravan, which developed later in the 9th, 10th, 11th centuries, uh, were also the carrier of bubonic plague from Central Asia. Mm -hmm. So the plague germ traveled along the trade route and reached Europe and in the 14th century, and, the and that devastated Europe. A third of European population perished in eight years as this disease spread through the trade route. So the trading basically stopped. So we can say that globalization uh, was stopped and distracted by black death in Europe. But mm -hmm. then it resumed again. Those who survived, they wanted mm -hmm. to live better. And all the motivations that have, we have described came into play and life resumed again and trading again flourished. And then of course comes the um, Muslim uh, rise of the Muslim power in the Middle East, blocking the trade route to India. India was the major destination and China for the Europeans looking for spices, silk, cotton textile. So then they started looking for alternative routes which led to Columbus's attempt mm -hmm. across the Atlantic mm -hmm. and Vasco da Gama went around Africa to reach India in 1498. Mm -hmm. So the, there have been um, obstacles and people have found a way around mm -hmm. it. So, so it's, a, it's really a compelling force, yeah. which is, I guess, uh, 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 what you're arguing, that, yeah. that it, 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 it's because it, it's embedded in the human condition. I think it's a human DNA. You can say that globalization or mm -hmm. desire to leave one's home, to go somewhere, to, to connect, to live better, mm -hmm. to have an enriching or more fulfilling life, is something that is so inherent in us that is impossible to stop. Mm -hmm. Now, you, you said that you started this uh, at the, at the uh, time of the, the, the new millennium. Uh, uh, and uh, so the question arises, in what ways uh, does globalization today distinctive uh, from, uh, 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 even though it emerges from this history that we've been talking about? Well, the, I think there's three main differences. The difference number one, of course, is the technological changes have made the transactions in both goods and ideas much, much faster and more voluminous. Earlier, a camel caravan, a camel could carry about 50 kilogram, and you have a caravan of maybe 40 camels, and that's the sum total of goods you are carrying from one country to another. And now, on a container ship, the biggest container ship can carry uh, trucks, 20 mile long uh, hmm. trucks, um, that much of goods can, can be carried in one ship. So the result is the absolutely collapsing cost of transportation. Speed, of course, 
has immensely increased. And then communication, which was communication based on human being carrying information, to now a digital information which is instantaneous. Mm -hmm. So this speed and volume of transaction made it much more visible. So, and that's why we actually need a name for it. The word globalization came into dictionary in 1961, and it is not by accident that that was the year when American communication satellites mm. were, were circling the globe and connecting the globe in real time. So the communication revolution, transportation revolution has made the globalization much speedier, voluminous, and more visible. And the third aspect of visibility, uh, visibility is the second aspect. The third aspect is the imbalance. Earlier, the transactions involved a really small number of people, and it affected small number of people. But with the rise of modern capitalistic multinationals using huge resources to transfer goods, sell goods, the balance between those who are supplying and those receiving is very good. And that imbalance makes people very wary mm -hmm. as to we, do not, we are not in control of our lives. Mm -hmm. Those who are bringing these goods and ideas, they are more powerful than we are. Mm -hmm. So, so in, in a, uh, you, you're making an important point which I want to draw out, which is uh, that as a consequence of the distinctive nature of globalization today, there is a, uh, uh, a, a consciousness yeah. about this process, even if we don't know its history, which you're helping us, uh, a problem you're helping us deal with, that you, you, you are, that has very great political implications for the enterprise, because it's not that we're just, it's not just that we're doing it, more and more people know we're doing exactly. it. Exactly. Yeah. That, that, is, that is the most important um, difference in the past and present, that global awareness. In fact, I tell the story of this electrician in New Haven who came to my, our house to fix some non-working lights. And he asked me, what did I do for uh, at Yale? And I said, I worked at the Center for the Study of Globalization. And he was shocked as if I had confessed to being a charter member of a Colombian drug card, you know. <laughs> he said, God help you. I said, oh. I said, why should I need that help? He said, isn't it true that globalization destroys rainforest? Mm -hmm. And I said, yeah, maybe it does. But the closest I have been to Amazon was to order some books. But he was, <laughs> he, I don't think I convinced him. But the fact is, he's this electrician in New Heaven. He's a globalized citizen. He is concerned about rainforest in Amazon. Why is that? Which other electrician 50 years ago would have been worried about Amazon? And that, I think, is a big difference, mm -hmm. that the visibility of globalization has made people more aware of the global interconnections. Mm -hmm. And as a result, happier or, or sadder or worried. Or, but there is no doubt that people do realize that the life of human beings on this planet are interconnected. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, I guess I want to ask, because in, in your history, uh, there one gets the sense that uh, a, a problem emerging in the face of globalization is the inequalities that are a consequence but also a precursor of, of the globalization uh, process. And the way these, these human virtues that are driving these individual actors interface with this, this kind of reality of inequality uh, can exacerbate the process it did in history. Mm -hmm. It created inequalities that sometimes endured you know, for, for long periods of times. Uh, uh, talk a little about that, because that, that is a core issue mm -hmm. that, that emerges now. But, but I guess what I'm asking you about is a kind of a general statement about uh, the, the record of the interface between inequality and these processes. Yeah. I think um, 
connections with foreigners, whether in forms of uh, trade goods or religion or simply migrants coming into country, has always provoked resistance throughout history. And resistance has been manifested in many different ways. For instance, the Roman Empire was trading heavily with India. So tra Arab traders would come to India, get spices and silk, Chinese silk would be actually transited through India and take it to the Roman Empire. And Roman Empire was paying for this in, in gold coin. So there is the outflow of gold from Roman Empire to India, which was causing concern in the Roman Senate and Roman Emperor Tiberius uh, issued a, a statement in which he denounced this, uh, this, uh, this um, great luxurious living, stand, living of people which is causing the Roman Empire to drain wealth. But the fact remains, the historians point out that the Roman Empire actually was collecting uh, one third of the value is tax for all the imports. So the Roman coffer was being enriched mm. by the importation of these luxurious goods. So in the in overall, was Rome loser or winner, a gainer from this process? You know, it, it remains to be seen. But the fact remains that the tax was imposed by government throughout history to um, stop to some extent restrict the import and also gain revenue for the government. Um, people opposed arrival of missionaries of all types. Mm -hmm. They were killed, they were excluded, and in fact the world, two of the world's biggest adventurers, um, Ferdinand Magellan and Captain James Cook, both were killed by people he want, they wanted to connect with. So mm -hmm. that was the extreme form of resistance. Mm -hmm. And then there are periods when the British forcing Indian weavers, Indian um, um, farmers to grow indigo because that was a big export item. And when the price of indigo collapsed, these people suffered their livelihood. And so they were, there was a revolt against the British. It was known as the Blue Mutiny because of the color of indigo. There was revolt by the Chinese, Javanese rubber plantation and coffee plantation workers because of the, again, collapsing price of world market led them to be uh, laid off. And they rioted and the Dutch killed thousands of people. So this has been going on mm -hmm. throughout history of the results of this global interconnection in mm. terms of taxing, in terms of revolt, in terms of massacre. Um, mm. So this is, history is very rich with these kind of episodes. Mm -hmm. so, so although your book is called Bound Together, I guess the other part of this is driven apart mm -hmm. uh, uh, over time. Uh, and, and I guess at the heart of this is the extent to which these global processes can uh, create uh, a nationalist response, uh, an ethnic response, uh, as people, uh, I as these situations get bad that you've just described, they come to uh, identify with the local group that's being exploited. And, and many times, I guess, political leaders mm -hmm. uh, want to gain political power by uh, uh, enhancing these, mm -hmm. these feelings of uh, uh, driving the outsiders right. away and so right. on. Talk a little about that because mm -hmm. it, it's, it's a contradiction in all of this mm -hmm. because uh, we see that, that uh, uh, globalization does increase people's identity with the local. Yes. Uh, this is, in fact, a, it's a classic reaction, classic reaction to the threat to the identity. And so in case of, for instance, in Indonesia in the 1820s, 1840s, the Wahhabist Islam finally arrived in Indonesia. And that gave them the, the ideological tool to oppose the Dutch Christians. Mm -hmm. So the opposition to the Dutch colonial rule took the form of a religious revolt by the Muslims. Mm -hmm. 
in case of uh, China, you had several sort of sectarian revolt against Westerners. And uh, in case of Vietnam, Vietnamese monarch uh, killed Jesuit missionaries, saying these are threat to our national identity. Mm -hmm and then allowing the French to retaliate by eventually occupying Vietnam and then setting up a colonial empire. But the, again and again, religious political groups, individuals, have taken the leadership of this resistance to foreign influence and exploitation and, um, and led struggle against it. So nationalism is um, is, this is the, uh, this is the un, uh, irony of this situation. On the one hand, that nationalism is being nurtured by the flow of, from outside. Say, for instance, in India, the British made English uh, medium of instruction, allowing Indians to read books which give them ideas about political freedom, about democracy, and even their own history. The British archaeologists and historians discovered much of India's past and wrote history book, which gave the Indians a pride in their own national identity. Mm -hmm. So it's a kind of dialectical process in which the foreign influences, globalizing influences, help um, formulate national identity, which then revolts against the mm -hmm. foreign influence. A key issue in in moving globalization forward is, is really the the problem of management of globalization, of creating institutions, international ones, multilateral ones, that can get us over some of these bumps. And we seem to be in a race uh, between the negative forces, nationalism, the, the way consciousness about the process turns groups into protesters, which is not a bad thing, but which, in, in, if not managed globally through international institutions and multilateral institutions, will create a backlash. How do you, how do you see this playing out over time, and, and what will make uh, for institutions? that enable us to better manage this process in the face of globalization and rising consciousness about the negatives of the process? This is, this is the key question of the future, really, as to we are inexorably more and more integrated, and that integration is causing friction and question of identity and resistance. And yet, there is not enough awareness or effort to create institutions which can smooth things over, which has uh, a global structure. Now, in the past, whenever problems arose, eventually they got resolved. For instance, um, introduction of telegraph in the mid-19th century, suddenly time was instantaneous. So you are sitting in Washington, you're sending a cable to London, and that cable reaches within a few hours, but there it may be middle of the night. But you have no idea what time it is there. So the telegraph and a railway line made it necessary to have a time zone. So in 1890s, mm -hmm. a universal Time conference was held in Washington, which decided, divided the world in 24-hour time zones. So that was one of the earliest global governance issue, mm -hmm. how to manage time. Mm -hmm. So they agreed that this is the, how the time zone would be divided. Telegraphic uh, communication protocols were established in the Universal Postal Union, shipping rules. So again and again, the world community have come together to resolve issues which are of immediate practical consideration. So unless things are of immediate nature and of 
of a type that can be tackled through practical measures, it becomes more difficult. For instance, uh, the SARS episode, the crisis, the virus SARS, which spread from South China to Hong Kong and then to the world, was a replay of previous epidemics, back Black Death, Spanish Flu. But what was different this time mm -hmm. was that there was an organization called WHO, which didn't exist during mm -hmm. the Spanish Flu. So WHO took control and said, this is a very dangerous epidemic. It can be stopped only by stopping transportation between point A and point B. So flights are grounded. And because of the existence of WHO labs throughout the world, they collected samples. They did uh, research and found out, and, and basically the DNA of the SARS was um, decoded and, and, and a remedy found. So it is possible to resolve issues uh, in, with, through global cooperation. But what needed is needed is that ability and willingness and political willingness to actually sacrifice some of your sovereignty for the greater good. When SARS episode happened, countries surrendered the sovereignty by accepting WHO call to ground flights, even if it hurt their economy. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the pro when you look at uh, issues such as economic inequality, when you look at issues such as uh, agricultural products from the developing world, uh, having to confront the barriers and the subsidies that uh, developed countries have put in place to create political coalitions to govern, then, then, then you have a, a shocking result mm -hmm. that, that becomes a thorny issue that isn't, is at a higher level of difficulty mm -hmm. uh, than either telegraph or uh, a case of a worldwide potential for an epidemic. Talk, talk a little about that and, and how you see that playing out. I mean, your, your book, uh, uh, in your last chapters, you, you cite uh, many statistics. Um, just looking here, you say, uh, in 2001 to 2002, American farmers of cotton received $3.9 billion for 25,000 farmers. Uh, 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 and then during the same period or a similar period, 1999-201, eight African cotton states lost $330 million to export trade. How, how is this going to be yeah. worked through, so to speak? Yeah, this is the point I mentioned, the political will, mm -hmm. because it's ultimately it is political will, because 25,000 American cotton farmers getting $3.9 billion subsidy uh, is fine. I have no problem if they won't get subsidy, the U.S. government gives them subsidy, but that subsidy should be given in a way that doesn't distort the world price, mm -hmm. because the, by lowering the price of cotton in the world, you are basically putting out of business African cotton farmers who only grow cotton. Their land doesn't grow anything else. And so they are growing cotton, but they cannot sell it. So mm -hmm. it is a disaster for them. So, so if you tell the African countries to raise their, to remove their tariff against industrial goods, mm -hmm. which then Americans can sell there, but then you say, but he cannot sell your cotton mm -hmm. because we are giving subsidy to our farmers. Mm -hmm. So that is potently, potently unfair. And this is this kind of problem. Europeans give a billion dollar subsidy to some Greek farmers to, who grow, grow cotton. Now this is the kind of subsidy which politicians give in order to get reelected. Politicians, they have a time frame of four to six years time frame when they want to get reelected. They are not looking at the world situation as a whole, neither they're looking at 30, 40 years down the line, what would be the consequence of this kind of policy for farmers around the world. Mm -hmm. So we need people, we need statesmen, not politicians. We need people who appreciate how closely interconnected we are and whatever we do has impact on other people. Mm -hmm. And so we cannot be so selfish 
so narrow-minded that we practice, uh, we carry policies which has disastrous effect outside our country. So, so I, I hear you saying, or I'm concluding, and tell me if this is fair, that, that in a way it's these human and social forces that are pushing us together in a way, but, but, but in fact uh, those positive forces are going to have to be directed toward those political centers of power which look for the shortcut for the immediate solution and come up with solutions like this, these subsidies to cotton farmers in the United States that, that really exacerbate that forward movement. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So I think it is, and it is also I think, again, if one takes a long-term view, a broader view, you realize that it is ultimately self-defeating mm -hmm. because if it is not made into a policy to help improve the lives of other countries, people, increase their market share, your own industry ultimately will, will shrink because market share is not growing. Not more people are coming to the market to buy your goods because, because of your narrow-minded or short-sighted policy, you are closing on upon itself and markets are shrinking. Mm -hmm. now, now, in this process of education, uh, uh, the U.S. is going to play a critical role. Uh, so, uh, in a way, American citizens have to be educated about the complexity of these processes and their historical origins. But on the other hand, uh, the U.S. presumably has to play an important role in recognizing these global po uh, uh, problems and so on. How, how do you see that playing out? Because we seem to have gone through a period of, of American provincialism, American nationalism. Yeah, I think this is, of course, a very, very deep-seated uh, problem because politicians work for their re-election. And politicians have to be accountable and reflective of the opinion of his constituency. Mm -hmm. If the constituents are unaware of the world impact of what they do on the world, and if they do not see that the close linkages that there is, um, they are not going to ask their politician to anything other than help them. Mm -hmm. And so I think the, it is a, you know, in some ways catch-22, you have to educate the electorate in order to educate the politicians. And politicians have a role to educate the electorate as well, if they are, because they are much better placed to understand what is happening in the world. And it is their responsibility to some extent, along with the media, to convince the constituents that, that they have to make perhaps a little sacrifice now in order to, for bigger gain in the future. Your present position is uh, editor of uh, Yale Global Online. Tell us about what that is. You could even give us the URL, and, and, uh, but also how it hopes to contribute to this process of education. Yale Global Online uh, is an online magazine to explore many aspects of globalization and, and, and promote debate and discussion. And this online magazine, the URL is www.yaleglobal, Y-A-L-E-G-L-O-B-A-L, one word, dot Yale, Y-A-L-E, dot E-D-U. And Yale Global Online was launched in November 2003, uh, no, sorry, November 2002. And, uh, and in, this, in the last uh, five years, it has... Uh, gained a huge, huge adherence. Now we get one to 1.2 million hits per week, mm. and our we publish about three original articles every week. The articles are on aspects of globalization, written by experts, but written in an accessible way, so that an average uh, educated reader can understand the message of the story. And those articles are all archived on our site permanently, so they can be accessed anytime, anywhere, and it's all, all free. And then we have also some video interviews, which are video streamed, 
as well as uh, articles taken from other sites which deal with globalization and we have permission to reproduce them. So we write a short blurb explaining the context of the article and the importance of the article for understanding globalization and then give the article. So those kind of articles we now have over 3,000 on our site which are all hmm. uh, indexed and can be researched and found very easily. So this online magazine is actually our very modest effort to educate people to provoke discussion so that only through discussion and debate one can clarify one's own understanding. And because we have no political agenda, we are not for globalization or against globalization, we see this as a historical process which has to be understood and a lot of its kinks need to be ironed out, a lot of its problems have to be addressed. And so only by presenting the facts and issues of globalization in an objective way, we can perhaps help to understand this process better. Well, one final question. How would you advise students to uh, prepare for a world which will be even more globalized as time passes? I think the f most important thing is to open one mind, one's mind and look at the world. Look at uh, what is happening in other parts of the world. Look at hap what's happening to uh, your own peer group. How are the students in China, India, Brazil, Mexico, what are they trying to do? What is their ambition? What is their fear? What is their uh, desire? And to understand the world, to see how you fit in in this world. And in this fast changing world, to fit in, you have to be really inquisitive and open-minded because there is no specialty that is going to last forever. Hmm. You have to be going through many job changes, but only your curiosity, ability to understand, analyze the world will, will help you to live through this. Nayan, uh, I want to thank you, but first I'm going to show your book again, uh, uh, which our audience will want to read to get a sense of uh, how the forces of global globalization are changing our world. I want to thank you very much for coming uh, back to Berkeley and also for writing your book. Thank you. Thank you, Eddie. And thank you very much for joining us for this conversation with history. Mm -hmm.